our next selection, we're going to be singing hymn 312. Okay, so we don't have to turn very far for our next selection. It's 311, the hymn just before this one, 311.
And for our final hymn this morning, it would be 294. And if we could all stand for our final hymn. may be seated. Our scripture reading will be brought to us by Josh Sede. Proverbs chapter 3, five and six. So right here. Oh. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. Now if you all can join me in prayer. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we're privileged to come together this day on the Sabbath um, to worship our Creator. I ask, the Lord, that the Holy Spirit would come down upon each one of us and bless us as we try to come to understand and know you better and the friendship that we have with Jesus Christ, our Lord. Uh, just be with us this Sabbath, bless us, and help us to bless others as well. And I pray in Jesus Christ's precious and holy name. Amen. 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 So who's up next? Next up, we'll have special music. Faith Workmen will be singing, and Nathaniel will be playing the piano.
Cause what if your blessings come through raindrops? What if your healing comes through tears? What if a thousand sleepless nights are what it takes to know you're near? And what if trials of this life are your mercies in disguise? to hear We cry in anger when we cannot feel you near We doubt your goodness We doubt your love As if every promise from your word is not What if your blessings come through raindrops? What if your healing comes through tears? What if a thousand sleepless nights are what it takes to know you're near? And what if trials of this life are your Cause what if our greatest disappointments were the aching of this life? Is the revealing of a greater thirst this world can't satisfy? And what if trials of this life, the rain, the storms, the hardest night? Are your mercies in disguise? I praise God for our Pathfinder ministry. Amen. Amen. The Pathfinder Club here in Chula Vista has been in continuous operation, as I was told, was more than six decades now. Amen. And uh, we praise God that uh, you're part of it for supporting us. Thank you for answering those phone calls when our Pathfinder call you to participate either on a rummage sale or bike thon or just on Sabbath, uh, Saturday night, uh, game night where Pathfinders uh, could uh, sell some food for fundraising. And through that, we're able to go do our events, may it be camping, may it be honors, or may it be returning to the community and friends of church that we serve. So we'd like to return back to you in a form of report what we have done the entire year so that you know, oh yeah, we supported this child for this event. What happened? And we would like to express that in terms of pictures. We are prepared about a 10-minute uh, picture collection, and uh, we will share that with you this morning.
Good morning again. Um, I'm Rob Bamford, one of the co-directors of the club. And I want to echo what Aldi said earlier. Um, without the church family's support, um, a large event like this would not be able to be participated in by our club. So um, we are very grateful for all your participation. Um, some interesting facts. Um, when the attending Pathfinders go to Oshkosh, we swell the population of Oshkosh, Oshkosh Wisconsin by roughly 50%. So our 40,000 um, really do add a lot to them. Uh, over 5,000 of the people attending will be international from outside of North America. And let's see here. Um, some things that we need while we're there, they actually have a daily newspaper that they um, print for the people to keep touch on what's going on each day, uh, an on-site post office if you want to send a card home, um, and a communications tent to check email and stuff of that nature. Um, lots of activities and events for the kids to participate in. Um, every, um, we're going to be doing a community service event in a wildlife preserve. and uh, We've done um, community service events in the past, and there's numerous other um, places to do them as well. Uh, there is a community parade that we will participate in. I'm just going to start listing off a number of things that the kids will have an opportunity to participate in. There's the EAA Museum, which is an air museum, um, a working dairy farm, Drill team exhibitions, a petting zoo, teen challenge course, um, oh, dozens of honors, Messiah's Mansion, which you might recall, will be there for the second time, a climbing wall, obstacle course, um, different sports, uh, BMX bike uh, stunt demonstration, frisbee golf, uh, the creation investigation, which I'm personally curious to check out, uh, pin trading. And that's maybe a tenth of what I saw on the list. I didn't want to list every single thing. And basically, while we're there, you can watch. I believe it'll be on 3ABN, but you can probably get more information just before we go through the bulletin. Uh, they will be airing the programs live um, starting Monday, 8, August 11th uh, in the evening. I believe it's two hours difference. So that would be about 5.30 p.m. The program would start each evening. And we would encourage you to watch. Um, they have a wonderful live um, drama presentation. And this year's theme is Daniel, uh, with the title of Forever Faithful. And we'll also have the Sabbath program that would air. And that would be probably like 7 or 8 in the morning here. I'm not sure exactly when it's going to start. Um, but basically, you will have an opportunity to watch what some of the activities are that we have going on and encourage you to do so. It's, it's, it's truly a blessing and a um, lot of stuff that we have going on. Um, lots of spiritual and fun opportunities to be had and lots of people to meet. And that's basically what I wanted to share. I think you wanted invited me up to talk about the train. Transportation. Transportation. Basically, we're, uh, like we did last five years ago, we took the train. And we had an excellent time on the train. Uh, we provide all the food for the children, all the entertainment, and just going by train and watching the view go by is really something else. We really have a good time doing that. You want to add anything to that other than that? Uh, do you want to mention when we're leaving and when we're coming back? Uh, we're leaving on August 8th. Uh, we'll be gone 12 days. 12 calendar days. 12 days. Uh, coming back on the 22nd. Is that correct? 19th. 19th I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. I can't add. And uh, that whole time, uh, two, it takes two days to get there and two days to get back. And so we'll spend a week in Oshkosh. And, um, and as good a time we have at Oshkosh, we also have an excellent time on the train. We have a really fun time. Kids have a lot of fun. Get to know each other and play games and just do everything together. It's very nice. Want to add anything more? No, oh, that would do it. Okay. I'm going to say a closing prayer for the teachers. Could I have all the teachers stand, please? Uh, first, I'm going to read something from Hebrews, Hebrews <clears throat> chapter 10, verses 24 and 25. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. May we all bow our heads, and we have a prayer for the teachers. You, O oh God, are my strength, my patience, my light, and my counsel. It is you who make responsive to me the students confide to your care. 
abandoned me not to myself for one moment. For my own conduct and for that of our students, grant me the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of knowledge, and the spirit of the holy fear of you, and an ardent zeal to give your glory. I unite my efforts to those of Jesus Christ, and I beg all saints of heaven to assist me in the exercise of our teaching ministry. Amen. Amen. Thank you. And you're, you are dismissed to go to your Sabbath school class. Give us a second here, folks. Okay, let's try that. All right, there we go. So it's come time to pray, and perhaps you have some uh, prayer requests this morning. Of course, we're going to remember Judy, and I'd like to remember Pedro this morning. Any of uh, you have a request for prayer this morning? I know you do. You're just shy. Neighbor of mine, uh, our brothers going through some medical issues <clears throat> stemming from a, a few months ago when he was back and he has some uh, internal problems. Let's pray for him to be able to heal and for her to, because she's been taking care of him. Amen. Help her with her, her needs. Okay. 
Someone else. Yes, thank you. Um, on behalf of Marilyn White, uh, for a caregiver, um, the person that she thought might be able to do the job is balking a little bit, so I think she could really benefit from the assistance. Okay. How many have a request or something on your hearts that you're not comfortable maybe talking about, but it's something that's a burden on your heart? Okay. We've got one more. Okay, Ricky. Pray for uh, Enrique de la Cruz, the father of my sisters, of my daughter's father in law. Her, her wife died just last week. She needs to come for. I'm sorry, say that again. He needs. Oh, his wife passed away? Oh. Oh, my. Okay, let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, this morning we thank you that you're a prayer hearing God, that you when we bow our heads in Jesus' name and speak to you directly, that you not only hear us, <clears throat> but that your heart is inclined toward us, each one, just like we were the only ones praying. And that you, Lord, because of your great love for us, attend to our needs and our requests, again, as if we were the only one. Thank you for that love. And this morning, Father, in the name of Jesus, and because of your love, pray for Dave's neighbor who has been stabbed. Amen. We pray that he might be healed, Lord, and that these problems that he's having ongoing would be resolved and that he would be restored. We pray for Judy again. We thank you so much that from Sabbath to Sabbath she joins us here in Sabbath school and worship services. We pray for her full recovery, Father. Amen. We pray for Pedro. Lord, please, you know his situation. We pray that uh, he might be uh, delivered, for, Father, from, from the issues, the problems that he has been confronted with. Amen. We do ask, Father, that you would provide a, a caregiver for Marilyn. Amen. Lord, we thank you for her and her influence in our church. and We do pray that you would bless her in this way. Lord, we uh, each have burdens on our hearts that we don't speak of. And even though only a few hands went up, I know, Lord, that there are things that confront each one of us. Lord, please hear our prayer this morning for loved ones, for struggles that we have personally, physical or spiritual, whatever it is in our personal lives or in the lives of loved ones or friends. Amen. We pray this morning for uh, the father-in-law to uh, Ricky's daughter, Amen. who's lost his wife. We do pray for comfort, Father, for him. And again, Father, we thank you that we can bring all these requests to you in the name of Jesus. And also praying, Father, that you'd bless our study of your word Amen. for Jesus' sake. Amen. Amen. All right, we're on lesson four. Lesson number four. And the title of lesson four is Salvation. Salvation. That's what the whole Bible is about. Amen. From beginning to end, it's all about salvation. So we could be here a long time talking about salvation. <laughs> is salvation a gift? It is a gift, okay. 
How much does it cost? If it's a gift, it's what? What? Let's uh, normally. It's normally, it's free. What, what is? What's the abnormal situation? Well, it costs the blood of Christ. So salvation is not free. Whoops! Wait a minute. You know, you've you've heard it said, you know, free, you know, this or that. And, you know, and somebody says, nothing's free. You don't get anything for nothing. And I guess that's true, isn't it? So tell me a little bit more about the cost. Well, the Bible tells us that we are bought with a price. So, you know, it cost Christ's life on the cross for us. And so how do you put a price to that? Go ahead, answer your question. <laughs> answer my own question. It's, he paid the infinite price. There's, you can't put, how do you put a price on, on, some, on Christ's life? Uh, Christ is, you know, our Savior, our Redeemer. He's, he's everything. So you, you can't really put a price on it. Um, last night, just to mention real quick, we were opening Sabbath and we were talking about the young man who had the debt with the king and yet he was unwilling to forgive somebody that had a debt with him. And uh, we all have a debt <laughs> that was paid for us by, by Christ. Brother Ross, I, I just want to go a little bit more with what he's saying. In the Old Testament, it talks about to, to, for payment for their sins, they used to uh, sacrifice a lamb or a goat or a bull. Uh, and in the Old Testament, it talks about that it can't be an animal that's sick or lame or otherwise, you know, is going to die really soon anyways. I mean, it's not a sacrifice if that's the case. Let's sacrifice this goat because it's going to die next week anyways. It's not, that's not a sacrifice. It talks about how it had to be perfect. Well, Christ was perfect, sinless. So it, it's more than just life. It's, it's a perfect life. What else did it cost Jesus? Well, in order for him to come here and pay the price, it cost him his, he had to leave his position in heaven and come down here, which we know the angels had a hard time comprehending how somebody divine would want to come down here and be in our shoes and, and walk this sinful earth. Um, it was hard for them to understand that. So it, did, it cost him his position at one point in time. And his, so just for a short time it cost him his position? Well, he eventually went back and sat on the throne, but uh, when he came here, he had to basically lower himself to come down here. So, yeah, Ellen White says, well, what does she say about the, the distance between where he was and what it meant to come here? Anybody remember? <coughs> Or the price. She says it was an almost infinite step down. Almost infinite. Think about that. Almost infinite step from where he was to come here. Now tell me more about him coming here because I don't, I don't, you know, I may have been turning to a text in my Bible here when you, you, you may have said it already, but there's more to what it cost him that I didn't, I don't know whether you brought up or not. And that is that he took on humanity. That's the almost infinite step from there to here. So is salvation free? Okay, over here. Well, go, go ahead, Ross. Go ahead. Real quick. Um, it came at a high price. I think we, we need to be careful, especially in today's world we live in, people 
it is a gift, but it comes at a cost. And it's very easy to make salvation cheap when you don't realize at the cost that it comes. Um, it's free to us, but also to continue to follow Christ comes at a cost. Um, and so we have to think about that. It's not just something that I receive and then I continue to live my life however I want to live it. We become a slave to Christ, basically, and with that, there is a price that, that has to be paid. Pastor, did you still want to comment? No, basically, uh, the price was paid by Jesus, and because of that, we are able to claim it for nothing. Now, there is a, there is a cost for following Jesus. I mean, it's, it's a total surrender to him. But the price for our sins has been taken care of. So if we don't have to pay that price. It's been taken care of by Jesus. Okay, so we're in agreement here. Anybody have anything else to add to that? All right, so let's run through the cost. We say it's free to us. Now, I'd like to know what does that mean it's free to us because you've already, it's almost like we're saying two different things here. But anyway, it's Jesus, number one, died on the cross. That was a pretty big price to pay for us. So it's not free, completely free. It costs something for our salvation. Next. Yeah, it's paid for by him, but it did cost. Salvation did cost something. Sin always has a price to pay. Okay, well, I'm going to come back to that. Yeah. Okay, we, it doesn't cost us anything. But how can we say that when you've just said that it requires something of us? Namely, full surrender. Ross, how did you put it? I'm sorry, I was filling out the attendance form. But I just said it comes at a cost. It was a, it's a very high cost. Okay, what is that cost? Well, for us... That, well, the cost that Jesus paid was his own life. The cost for us is to continue to follow him and surrender him. You know, the Bible says that, you know, the world hated him before they hated us, which means if we're going to continue to follow him, we're going to be the, the, the object of that hatred. Uh oh, now, see, now all of a sudden it's starting to cost me something. Mm -hmm. I'm going to be and troubled if, in this and life. And if I can just comment, um, I think. For a lot of people, there's a reluctance to accept that gift because it doesn't come without strings. <laughs> you know how you say there's, there's always a string attached? Well, when we accept this free gift, there's supposed to be a heart change. There's supposed to be a transformation. Um, and there's things that are required for that transformation, that transformation to take place. And it's not easy. And I think a lot of people, that gift is there on the table always. But when they think about what's required after they accept that gift, it, 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 it's kind of sobering. James in the back. There's, um, I've thought of two different analogies when it comes to salvation and, and what our role, <clears throat> the role that we have to play in that. One of them, I was watching a video of some street preachers, and so a couple, uh, I believe they were either atheist or agnostic, they came and they posed the question, if God is so good, um, then everybody, uh, and he died for everyone's sins, then uh, everyone is going to be in heaven regardless of whether they believed in him or not, right? And of course, the people that were there preaching the word on the street said, no, that's not exactly how it works. You have to accept him. And when I, when I heard them having this discussion back and forth, it made me think of like a scholarship application. As a student, um, you might not necessarily have enough money to go to school or to get supplies or a new laptop or something, but there's someone that can provide that for you. And um, <clears throat> first off, you have to acknowledge the party that's giving the, the scholarship. You have, to, uh, you know, have to apply for the scholarship and um, and then you have to meet the requirements of that scholarship to get the benefit from it. Um, there's another analogy, for example, a homeless shelter. 
Many times if homeless people, you know, it's freely given to all who want it and who need it. But if you're going to go to that homeless shelter, you have to make sure that you're going to be clean while you're there. You're not going to be um, on drugs or anything. They have certain criteria that you have to meet while you're there. It's open to absolutely anybody that needs it, and it's given free of charge. It costs them to run the program, but it's free for you to go in there with the condition that you meet what they're asking you to do. So, in a sense, there is a price to pay in both those situations. Um, so, Jesus dies on the cross. Okay? We don't have to do that, right? Amen. Let me do that again. Let's see if we have unanimity here. Okay, Jesus dies on the cross. We don't die on the cross. He died on the cross for us, right? Okay, now I got, I, I got Ross's wheels turning, and I think he's going to say exactly I, I, where I know I'm, where you were heading with this. Yeah, so okay, I, right. Um, there is a cost to be a Christian, and we know that in of ourselves we can do nothing. And so what that requires is actually dying daily. The Bible says I must die daily. Whoops. I thought he died for me. He did, but we, we still have to die to self daily. And I got to die. He had to die once on the cross, and I got to die every day. To self, yes. Oh, man, this is starting to get costly. <laughs> so th- there is a cost, and that's, so you Jesus, know, that's the struggle that we all face. Is so getting Jesus up and saying, dies on the cross, mm-hmm. right? I die daily. Okay, go ahead. I'm sorry. But the good news is he doesn't leave us in that situation and say, I have to die to myself daily, but I, ha- I don't have the tools to do it. He gives us the tools to be able to die to self and say, not my will, your will. Okay. So he equips us. That's the whole justific- justification, sanctification. Now, what I want you to concentrate on this cross thing. I want you to think of the cross, mm-hmm. okay? Jesus died on the cross. He's the only one who dies on the cross, huh? Doesn't the Bible, didn't he say something about taking up your... Go ahead, say it. Wait, wait, before you turn it over to Ricky, t- say that, Robert. He would said, take cross. up your what? Cross. cross. So I have a cross. Wait a minute. I'm going to die on a cross. I thought you said he died on my cross. My. It's starting to get costly. I have a question, sir. My question is this. What uh, is the reason why God himself uh, made it his uh, initiative to send his son to die for us. Why, why did he do that? Yeah, why? why? All right. Tell us why. why did... I have the, the, the first answer that I have is because of God's love. But there is uh, another one that I'm thinking, if it is right or wrong, I don't know. Okay, what is the other one? Uh, it is because... Above all, God was the one who created everything. He was the one who created Satan that caused the world to suffer because of the temptation that is God. So he must be responsible also for saving the people that was saved by the creature that he made. Did you follow that? All right, I think, let me see if I did. He created the world, and therefore he, he, he takes it upon himself uh, if, as creator uh, or I should say, because he is the creator, he f- senses or feels the responsibility of, of rescuing, rescuing us from, from, our, uh, from our predicament with sin. Is that right? Anybody want to comment on that? Well, you, mentioning, you mentioned at the outset that the, the whole Bible talks of salvation, but the whole theme... Is restoration as well. If we think about that God created us in his own image and we were to be created to be in communion with him, and once sin entered the world, that was broken. Um, and the only way for that to be restored and for us to return into the state that we were created, there had to be, there had to be a price that had to be paid for that. And Christ bridged that gulf, that infinite chasm that was between us and God. He's bridged that which allows us to one day be restored into the, to our original position that we were created to have. Let 
This is kind of off the subject, but uh, I went to see Pastor Mark Fox uh, in the meetings last night, and he wanted to everybody to come over and visit his meetings. He wanted to give everybody an invitation to come over. So, Okay, I want to go back to this cost business, the cost analysis. Didn't Jesus say something about sitting down and counting the cost? Didn't he advise us? Didn't you know? Did, didn't he tell a parable about someone who counted the cost? You know, if a king wants to go out and he's going to go to war, he should make sure he can win the war. Or, do you remember an, uh, an analogy like that on his part? It, it is. It's good for us to talk about what does this cost. And um, from what I'm hearing, I'm hearing that it here this morning that, you know, it cost Jesus an almost infinite step down from where he was to become one of us. An almost infinite step. I just, you know, I, I can't get over that. Just the, that thought just captivates me. And then, of course, on the cross, it, he paid an infinite price. Somehow, mysteriously, somehow, he paid an infinite price for you, for me, for him, for her, for them, for all, every single one of us. He paid that almost infinite price for each one of us. But then, if, if I may just, just a second here. But then, you turn that right around and we're saying, you know what, it does cost us something. And I want to tell you what I think it costs you to be a follower of Christ. Everything. It costs you everything. Christ gives you everything, but then he requires everything. There's nothing you can hold back from him. If you hold back anything from him, if, not, if, if there's any small part of my life that is not fully surrendered to him, I don't qualify to enter into the kingdom of heaven because something there is an idol to me. Something there is more important to me than Christ, than being in heaven, than my family, you know, that, that is praying for me to be there with them in his kingdom. Can you imagine that? You know, my family's there and I'm not there and how it's going to break their hearts or vice versa. You know, I'm there and they're not there. In any case, it costs us everything. Amen? So, is salvation free? I'll tell you how it, how is it free? Well, one way it's free is I don't have to die on the cross that Jesus died on. That's the part that's free. That he did, and that's without that, everything else is meaningless. Okay, that's the very bedrock of salvation. Is is what Christ did on that cross? Yes. Sorry I to make you wait so long. I was just going to say, I think sometimes, like I agree with you, everything has to be surrendered in every area of our life. But sometimes I think it's harder when you go in up in the church. To, to realize the cost. Because it's people who come into the church who lose their friends, who lose their job, who lose a lot. And oftentimes when we've grown up in the church, we're already doing some of these things. We think we're okay. It doesn't, on the outskirts, it doesn't seem like it costs us anything. But it really, you can really see it when someone has to make a complete life change. It does cost them a lot. Even family to some point. That's a good point. Thank you. I think it's free in the sense that you don't pay for it and get it. You get it, and then you pay for it. You know? <laughs> <laughs> is this a lease program here we're talking about? <laughs> uh, what I'm saying is, I, I certainly agree with both the workmen's, um, but the change comes from true acceptance and from... Um, Submitting to Christ—that's when the change comes. 
unless you do that, uh, unless you've accepted that, there's no real change going to occur. Um, you know, tithe is a great example of that. If if you haven't accepted, why tithe? You know, um, if you, yeah, but unless you've totally accepted Christ, it's senseless. Jesus tells us to seek his kingdom and his righteousness. He tells us to strive to enter through the narrow gate. Um, you know, we say that salvation is not by works, but there are works to do. There is effort to be made. There's a beautiful quote. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I wish I had brought it out here with me. I don't have it with me. I have a quote from Ellen White if that I really love. Spread, then uh, I should say that because of uh, salvation we have faith, but faith without work is dead. So we have to do something to show really that we have faith and we have love. So it requires something. Surrender, Surrender yes. So uh, Ellen White says, um, she says, when it is in the heart to, uh, to desire salvation and when efforts are put forth to that end, and I'm paraphrasing heavily here, God accepts that as man's best and purifies and makes it acceptable with the righteousness of Christ. When it, is in, when, it, when it is in the heart to obey and efforts are put forth, you know, in that direction, God accepts that as man's best and makes it acceptable before the law through the merits of Christ. That's a little closer to what she says. That's a beautiful thought, isn't it? But you know what else she says in that same quote? Now, this is, this is 1890. That's two years after the Minneapolis uh, General Conference in which the, you know, the, the two young fellows got up there and preached righteousness by faith, and there was some sort of legalistic thinking there, and um, there was a big controversy over righteousness by faith and righteousness by works. And she took the side of righteousness by Nancy, did you say it? I, b I believe it was faith. Yeah. She took the side of righteousness by faith, that, uh, that uh, Butler and so forth that were warring against Wagner and Jones were wrong that, um, because they had a works emphasis. Okay? But listen to what she says. She said, um, we hear a great deal about faith. We need, this is two years after that. She says, we hear a great deal about faith, but we need to hear a great deal more about works. I found that amazing. You know, the timing, the context of it, and so forth. I just found that amazing. We need to hear a lot more about works. And the reason why is because some people have a care, carefree uh, easygoing Christianity, you know, that's compromising and, and uh, you know, it doesn't cost anything to be a Christian. It's all free. It's all finished at the cross. Everything's done. It's all finished. And all I have to do is sit back and wait for the day. But what we've been saying here this Occupy. Yeah, thank you. But but what we've been saying here this morning, I think, is more true, a more true picture of what it really is to be saved. Amen. And we're talking about salvation. Yes, it's free in a, in a very real sense because Jesus paid the price for us on the cross. That we cannot add anything to and dare not try. Amen. We dare not try to add our righteousness to his righteousness. Dare not add our 
suffering to his, to, to recommend ourselves, to make ourselves seem worthy to God of salvation. There's a totally different reason why, though, there is a price to pay. Amen. And one of the major reasons is because you have an enemy, and he wants to make you pay a price. He wants it to cost you something. And so you meet opposition, you meet temptation. And that requ does require, uh, you know, that we keep our hand in the hand of the Lord and walk forward in this life, gaining, you know, strength and victories over those things that, that are tempting us and challenging us. Okay. Um, okay, a couple of comments here. You know, to make this thing very practical, uh, well, you know, the Bible says that we, we ought to be paying our tithe and our offerings to the Lord, you know. When I was growing up, I, I said to myself, you know, I'm the one to make my money. I'm not going to give it away. So for years, as a young person, I really balked against this idea of giving God 10%. So, so he, that, had a, he had a certain, a certain cross that uh, was waiting for him to be crucified on. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, uh, when I became a minister, I felt like, well, I better start paying tithe. They're going to catch up with me. So totally, I, totally the right reason to be paying tithe, right? <laughs> yeah. So I, I started That's paying That's rather self-serving, you know, there. Yeah, I know. So I started paying my tithe. Well, after I'd been in the ministry for about, about two and a half years, uh, they put me in a little dinky church, that really need to be remodeled. It was called Fleetwood, Pennsylvania. And Fleetwood's where the Fleetwood Cadillac came from. But I want to tell you, that church was no Fleetwood. <laughs> it, was, it was in bad shape. So we had a man from the Union by the name of Mel Reese come and talk to us. And he analyzed the situation. So he said, I want to talk to you, Burton. I said, well, okay, sure. What do you want to tell me? He says, well, listen, your church is a dump. <laughs> But he says, you know, it can be made right. But you know, if it's going to be made right, you have to lead the way. And I said, well, what do you mean? He says, well, I would highly suggest that you pay not only your tithe, you give a double tithe. Mm -hmm. Oh, boy, I'll tell you, that sent me in a tizzy. Because we, <laughs> you know, I just didn't make enough money to pay a double tithe, you know. And I was really upset. I was really angry about the whole thing. It is here. true that he, he didn't make a lot of money. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. Well. I just didn't, uh, I was so upset about that thing. I wrestled with that almost all night long. And finally I said, okay, God, I am going to give you a challenge. I'll pay my tithe, double tithe, for three months. But at the end of those months, if you haven't come through, you're, I'm done with you. you know? Goodness well, sakes. Well, to make a long story short, and I won't go into all the story. But we're still doing double tithe, and we're doing more. We're giving up to 25, 30% of our money away now. And you know something? When I retired, when we retired, everything is taken care of. Yeah. And I looked back on it, and I said to myself, man, I tell you, it was, it was a struggle to get started on it. But boy, it turned out to be a great big blessing. So paying my double tithe is no, no problem for me anymore. I understand that principle. And I think it's the same way with stepping out in faith. Uh, sometimes we're asked, well, you know, when you, uh, if, you, if you are going to be really a Christian, it means that you've got to be honest. Well, all right, so you've got to be honest, but that's tough for some people. But you've got to do it, and when you do it, you're going to find out it's going to pay great rewards down at the end. Now, no matter what we do in life, you know, uh, we're, we're going to be tempted to do things wrong. But if we decide that we're going to, Follow the Lord through this. It cost us at first, we think. But really, when you look back on it, there is no cost. We're just, we're, God is coming through. He always comes through. And the sooner we learn that, the better off we are. So now you're saying, let me, let's, let's wrap our minds around this. So what you're saying is, is that, yes, it costs, but it really doesn't cost. That's right. The efforts we made, the trials we go through, they're really small potatoes. And God blesses us so much that in the end, we look back and say, heaven's cheap enough. Right. Well, let me just tell you one little story that really, to me, sums it up. 
Uh, we were at a place and we had an acre of land and we decided we we're going to split it off because, you know, and so we split it off and we sold a half an acre and kept the other half. And uh, at first everything went great. And then finally the guy that bought this half acre says, you know, I, I'm not going to be able to keep on making the payments on this property and I don't know what to do. But he said, I found a man who, who will take the property from you and uh, he, he said he'd promised to pay it and so forth. So I said, okay, I'll talk to him. So I did. Well, it turned out that this guy was a, a lawyer. He wanted to buy the property. And he made me all kinds of big promises. And so I, uh, somehow I had in the back of my mind this was not a good deal. But uh, I decided to do it because, you know, I wanted the money out of this thing. And so um, we signed the agreement. And for about six months, he made his payments regularly. And then all of a sudden, he quit. And I could not get a hold of him. I could, you know, I called there and the secretary, well, he's not in today. Uh, oh, he's busy. He's tied up with a customer. I'll tell him to call you back. He never would call back. Well, after a, a long period of time, we were asked to move to uh, um, Nebraska, uh, Lincoln, Nebraska, to work there for the, in the conference office. And... Um, so we moved there, and all of a sudden I get this bill in the mail for $78,000 from a bank. And I called him up and said, what is this all about? He said, well, you know, you co-signed on that property, and the property, well, you both are owners, and he has stopped paying his payment, so we're going to, we have to charge you. Oh, man, that really sent me in a tizzy. I think, $78,000, I'm going to have to pay this? And I will tell you, I stewed and worried. And finally, I said, Lord, you know what? You know, I've been trying to be very faithful and honest to you. And I'll tell you what, Lord, you get me out of this, and I'll give you all that money that, that, that 78, I don't have to pay it. Why, uh, that's good. And if I make any profit, that's all yours. Well, I kept trying to call this man. And after I'd made that agreement with the Lord, he picked up the phone and answered it. And uh, so he said, yeah. I said, yeah, this is Pastor Maxwell. Yeah, what do you want? He said, well, I want to tell you something. You know, that property we have problems with that you haven't made any payments on it. All of a sudden I got this bill from uh, uh, the bank saying that I had to pay it. Yeah, what about it? I said, I want to tell you something. I have given that property to the Lord. So it's not my money. It's God's money. Man, there was a silence on the other end of the phone for a quite a while. And finally he says, well, in that case, maybe I better take care of it. <laughs> and he did. And he took care of it. I made over $15,000 off that. But I told the Lord I was going to give him everything, even that profit. And that's, oh, no, I'm giving away that, you know. So, but I gave it away, and I'm really happy to do it. Because I thought, well, God brought me out of this thing. I don't know how he did it, but, you know, he worked in that man's heart. And, uh, and so what I'm saying is that I think that if you take God and you say, okay, God, I'm going to follow you no matter what. I'm going to do what is right. And, you, and he will see you through those times and he'll bring you out. Amen. Amen. That's good. Thank you. Happy Sabbath to everybody. Thank you. Um, I have an experience where I don't have, I don't have anything, um, but I think it is commitment to the Lord. It is self-denial on your part. Because when you think about yourself, just yourself, what, it, what good does it do you, you know? I, I have to think of my fellow men, you know, and my mission in the Philippines, um, it is a very good experience. And uh, when I came back, these people need uh, money for their tuition. And I have committed myself to that. And I said, Lord, I don't know where to get this money. Um, so I said, I just trust you. And... I told the four students, I said, okay, I don't have the money right now, but 
um, probably just go ahead and, I mean, I don't have the money, uh, probably in June. I was just trusting the Lord. And I said, okay. And they enrolled, the four of them enrolled immediately without anything, without money. And so I said, whoa. And then um, July, I received my, suddenly I received my tax refund, which is more than 900. And I said, Lord, this is for you. It's not for me. So I gave almost all of it. But in the mail, just the two days, oh, three days ago, last week, by the way, I received a, um, I received a letter from uh, Retina California Association, and I owe them 2935 And I should be paying them in, in payments. But the letter said, Josephine, you're not, your zero balance, we have waived that money that you owe us. Wow. So I think that God, when you you, uh, give yourself, commit yourself, and submit everything to the Lord, he will take care of you. Amen. Amen. Well, that's a good way to end the class today. We uh, are afraid we've come to the end. And Ricky, would you have prayer for us? Pastor, I would like to ask you, you make it uh, more understandable for me, this statement which is stated in the second paragraph of the lesson on Sunday, which says, Sir, God's love is not an impulse based on his feeling or preference. His love is not selective, nor does it depend on what we do. God loves the world that is all human beings, including those who do not love him. My question is, is not uh, salvation reciprocal? Is not salvation what? Reciprocal. Salvation? Yeah. It's not all grace, because if it's all grace, even those sinners can be saved. Or they, because they are not worthy, but they because God says is including those who do not love Him, those who do not obey Him, He will be saved. What, what what that's saying is just that He loves them, whether we're lost or saved. God loves us. So I want to make this clear: if what is really the meaning of this, including those who do not love Him, He loves people who do not love Him. Yeah, it doesn't say He's going to save them; it says He loves them. But they cannot be saved. Salvation well, they, is, they can be. Salvation includes but, love. Is but including whether they will salvation. or not, whether we will or not, depends on our choice. Look, I'm sorry. We're going to have to close here. So, Ricky, would you have our closing prayer, please? Pardon? Would you pray for us now yeah, yeah. as we close the class? Yeah, okay. Dear Heavenly Father, we are very thankful that your love is not uh, based upon our love for you, but you love us more than that, that even you gave your only begotten Son, mm-hmm. that through our faith in him, our salvation is sure. And thank you, Lord, for this, and may thou help each one of us to love you more from day to day until Jesus comes. Amen. 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 Thank you, everybody, for being here. We're glad to, uh, to see you here this morning and pray that God will bless you in the service that comes next.